Hi, everyone. Hey. I was wondering if that was you, Ryan. Hey everybody, can you can you guys hear me okay? Yep. So I guess we were just waiting for Mike now, and then we can get started. Oh, you are. I didn't see you in the list of attendees. Huh. Let me make you co-host real quick. All right. So at 37 participants right now, um, do you mind if we wait two, three more minutes? Please do. My computer is just recovering from a forced reboot. So <laughs> from a hard day at work. Minutes. <laughs> uh, I, I, I updated today with the latest MacOS update and it's decided to die on me twice coming back from sleep completely. So. Maybe a little warning to others to stay away. <laughs> a risky move for today, Mike.
So I think we can um, get started with the intros so we don't uh, start too late uh, right now. Um, I am, as I expressed, I think through the meetup uh, page as well as the Shape Up forum, I was a bit um, caught off guard by the sudden or la late uh, search in interest, which is, as Ryan said, a good problem to have, I guess. Uh, so I'm super, super happy to that this uh, drew such a crowd after all. And um, also, I think this uh, probably came with the announcement of you, Mike, being here tonight to speak to us. <laughs> um, Mike, um, just a few words on you for everyone. I am Mike's the VP of product at Slide. And he's previously worked at GitLab and Skype um, to mention a few stations. And you've been using ShapeUp with your team since before it was even called ShapeUp, I think. Uh, so you said October 2018 was when you guys did your first cycle. Uh, so that's been about one and a half years. Um, so yeah, very excited to have you to learn from your insights, how you've adopted parts of ShapeUp and how you've um, kind of tweaked to your needs. And then I also want to introduce Ryan, uh, who I don't think needs an introduction, but still I want to say uh, thank you for uh, both joining uh, tonight, for promoting this so heavily, and um, for sharing what you know, uh, what you learn, and how you think for the past 16 years, basically. And um, in that sense, I think Shape Up was a gift quite literally, since it was free to the product community and uh, sincerely want to kind of thank you from all of us, if I can. Of course, yeah, David, thank you so much for organizing this. And um, it's really fun for me to see people coming together kind of on their own, you know, with interest with interest in all this. So this is great. And uh, um, I, I just wanted to say that um, I'm starting to see uh, shape up as it's presented in the book, almost like the Ford Model T. It's this uh, very early thing that is highly, highly integrated. You know, the first, when the first car was built, it was every part was custom fitted to every other part. And, and the system wasn't modularized in such a way that you could, uh, you know, buy a part for your engine uh, independent of a part from the transmission from different vendors because none of the boundary points between the different subsystems actually had actually been worked out yet. So um, I think this is a really great learning opportunity for all of us to sort of see how people pull out different pieces of the uh, 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 of shape up and how it starts to modularize into something that has sort of you know separate components that you can actually pull in and mix and match according to what's going on and uh, really look forward to hearing hearing what Mike has to share here today. Awesome, thank you. So Mike, stage is yours. <laughs> Let me just get my screen up quickly because I have a number of slides. Great. Um, David, thank you. And I'm sure that most people have joined due to Ryan's participation, probably not mine. Um, my name's Mike. I, as David said, I, I had a product at Slight. Um, I'll tell you a bit more about our company a bit later just to set some context to help understand the size of our team and the maturity of the team because I think it's really important to you know understand where a company is in terms of its life cycle when you're adopting a process um, but yep yeah, that's me I like to tell stories and I like films and so I thought I would basically tell a story through the medium of film on um, how we adopted a new way of working um, I was just checking through some logs on when we started writing our, our first pitches and it was to the day 538 days ago. And so we've had some ups and some downs and I wanted to talk you through a little bit about firstly, some background a on, on me and my experience with different methodologies and on the company. Um, secondly, on um, some of the problems we were trying to solve with Shape Up, And then finally, how our adoption went and what it looks like today. As Ryan mentioned, we don't, you know, practice it completely in terms of the, the book. There are various portions of it that we've adopted and various portions that we haven't. Um, so let's start with Act One, which is the, my background and some problems we were trying to solve at Slight. So this is back in 1998. 
um, when the film The Big Lebowski was released. And this was effectively when I started my tech career in tech startups. And this was me, I, I thought I was the dude and I used to basically run projects like this. And it was the most amazing thing I'd ever seen and I could drag things around. And of course it was basically just a pack of lies. Um, in 2001, when I was in London, I joined another startup called Workshare. And when I was interviewing the, the founder and CTO said to me, have you ever heard of this thing called extreme programming? And I said, no, tell me more. It sounds incredible. What is extreme programming? And for those of you who are not familiar with it, it is a flavor of agile. Many of the original signatories on the agile manifesto were part of creating extreme programming. And it's a mechanism of working that includes um, two week sprints, it includes pair programming and quite other radical ideas. And this was my first exposure to a different type of methodology and my first exposure to um, an agile methodology. Um, in 2008, I jumped aboard this bus um, at this tiny little company called Skype. that was just doing voice calls over the internet at the time. And I joined there and there was basically no process whatsoever. And during my time there, we transitioned to, to Scrum. Um, in case no one recognizes, this is Matt Damon in, in Invictus, um, and which also happens to be my home country of South Africa. And whilst that time, while, whilst we did that transition, I went through the sort of proudest moment of my career, getting my Scrum certified product owner certificate, which is just so great and meaningful. Um, and then I sort of, in 2017, I joined GitLab and I'd, I'd basically been working in two week sprints for the past 15 years. And at GitLab, they practiced monthly delivery cycles. So every second day on the, every, every 22nd of every month, they would release a new version of GitLab. And there was a whole bunch of things they did wrong with that. And, there was no continuous delivery, for example. So literally on the 22nd of every day, about 600 pull requests would go live into production in one go. Um, but it was the first sign I'd seen of doing something a little bit slower and not necessarily taking two weeks um, and all these two week sprints. And that sort of led me to 2018 when I joined Slight. And there were some problems that I saw when I arrived, the team was quite small. Um, so today we're only about 20 people. We're a fully remote company. Um, but there were a few things that I sort of, that was proving problematic. So firstly, and this is one of the problems I've always felt with, especially Scrum, is there's a lot of ceremony. There's sprint kickoffs, there's sprint retrospectives, there's backlog grooming. And I found, especially in a remote team, spending a huge amount of time on calls with all of the ceremony that was going on around building software and not enough actual building software and not enough problem solving. So this was one problem we were trying to address. The second one is a lot of bigger projects that we were working on, they just weren't being shipped. Um, and it would go from iteration to iteration from sprint to sprint without actually hitting production, without hitting customers. And that was proving problematic. Um, and then finally, and probably most importantly, and this was maybe not necessarily a problem at Slight, but this is just something I'd been feeling for a long time, is that it, this continual sprinting just felt like being on a hamster wheel and running a marathon, but running it by sprinting all the time, getting a bit stale. And I, I've seen ways of people combating this, but it, it, it felt to me like it was time for something else. Um, and so it was around this time that I came across this particular article. Um, so this was before there was a book and before it was called Shape Up. And there, were, there was a lot that resonated with me in terms of trying a new way to work. And this was an eye opener. And I reached out to Ryan and we had some, some conversations and our team basically started adopting um, this process. So I think we had agreed, David, to sort of rather than take questions at the end, but just to pause at certain sections of the conversation and just take some questions and so, or some comments as well from the audience. And so I really wanted to, to do that just from people's experience or people's problems that they're trying to solve if they have moved to shape up or they're considering moving to shape up. 
uh, if, if you had anything up until this point, I think that now would be a good time to do it. And then I'll start talking about sort of the adoption curve after that. Yeah, so let's take some questions. Um, feel free to post them to the chat. Uh, I can, uh, I'll be monitoring there. And um, all right, so Dietrich is asking, how many product roles do you have in your team, Mike? In terms of product managers? Um, I, I product that's roles. The question. Well, I, um, yes. <laughs> okay, well, we have, we have effectively two PM roles and two design roles. Um, but I'll talk a little bit about team structure later on as well. Um, but that's the, the sort of number of um, product type people versus, you know, maybe 12 developers, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the next question is about how do you break into shape up uh, when it was so hard to get companies to move from waterfall to agile? We didn't have a lot of inertia. I think that's a great question. Um, we were a small company. One of the things that I really noticed about Slack and one of the reasons I joined the team is people's willingness to accept change and to take on board feedback and new ways of working. And so for us, this wasn't a huge problem. At Skype, for example, when we adopted Scrum, that was a massive transformation and it was quite difficult to do the, the company by then was over a thousand people um, and there was a lot of resistance people had this idea that if it ain't broken don't fix it and quite frankly I think it's important to make people understand where it's broken and why it's broken and what something looks like uh, and what a fix looks like and then I think there are basically two ways you can go about implementing something like this at Skype, we did it top-down mandated across the entire company with OKRs that were linked to it. And that's one way to do it. I don't necessarily think that's the best way to do it. The other way is to, if you are a large company, is to start it in a small team and show wins and prove success and communicate that out and then start growing it bottom up rather than a top-down forceful adoption. And I would, for larger companies I would, or larger teams, I would probably think that's the best way to do it. Try it with a product, a team, try it for, you'll see three or four cycles um, to really learn from the mistakes that you'll make when you're adopting it as well um, and move forward from that. Um, following up, up kind of on the, uh, what made you adopt um, shape up because you said you read the blog article and you talked a bit about sprint fatigue and all these other things but was there a specific triggering event that made you switch from agile to shape up that made you shop <laughs> I, I wouldn't say there was a specific event I mean I'd been there for maybe a couple of months and things were going pretty well I think but uh, the I felt that there was this gap in the process, in the, the, the process the team was practicing. They were almost trying to practice a Spotify squads and tribes model, but without doing all of the good things that comes from having dedicated product or feature teams or de dedicated product teams. Um, and people were basically jumping from one project to another quite quite frequently and that what that often meant is that you didn't sort of build up some domain expertise in a particular area and that's not necessarily a problem that shape up solves but it's a problem that we've solved through also our adaptation of of shape up but i think more than anything else it was my experiences in the past and i felt that there were different ways you could do things and my learning from gitlab that you doesn't everything doesn't have to be done in two week sprints um, it can be done at a slightly slower pace and from you know, the success of, of Basecamp and some other people, I think Buffer as well were practicing something very similar and the folks at Duis were practicing something similar as well. And so it felt like there was something happening here and it was a good time to try it out. Yeah, got it. And then Federico is asking, I would say that working with Scrum, you feel this survival anxiety where if you don't deliver, you are lagging. Any tips to hack the system? <laughs> I think there are a few things about that that, I, that actually resonate with me as well. One of the 
I think negative aspects of how we adopted Scrum at Skype was people literally had an OKR to increase velocity. And I think that Scrum can adopt a output um, or optimize for output. So making sure that you're closing more issues, making sure that you are raising velocity and it's not necessarily adopting for outcomes. Um, and outcomes are, you know, how your business metrics are performing. Are you acquiring new customers? Are they staying longer? Are they paying you more money? Are they more engaged? Um, are they churning less? And so, you, you know, to me, I think if you did adopt something like this or tried an experiment like this, I would really focus on doing it on a KPI or a metric that was that could resonate with the business um, to show that measuring by velocity or optimizing for an elegant looking burn down chart doesn't necessarily lead to positive outcomes. Yeah. Um, and then there's maybe one more question to kind of both of you, I think, um, that you can both help us answer. Uh, Alexandru asks, does the shape up process look different if you are creating a brand new product rather than implementing a new feature? And Mike, do you do you have experience on that or an opinion on that? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, right now we're we're building on an existing product, um, and we're bringing new capability to it, and we're creating new product teams inside of it. But it's effectively the same products. I would imagine that in maybe the early early days of product development you want to be doing quite rapid product discovery and customer discovery and getting in front of customers. Um, six week cycles might work for that. I'm, I'm not sure, but I, th I think there might be someone more suited to talking about this, given that there's some new product development going on at, uh, at Basecamp, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is something I'd be happy to get into. Um, if Maybe if someone can, can, can help to remind to bring it back, because it's a it goes a little bit out of the flow of what Mike is sharing, and I'd like to kind of stay in the in the stream of, of, of his presentation. So I'd love to come back to that later if someone can raise a finger and then remind it, because it's, it's a question that comes up often. All right, let me make a note, and then we'll bring it up in the more general Q&A towards the end. OK. So I think what I wanted to talk a little bit about was the adoption of of shape up and some growing pains that we experienced with it. Um, and I'm not going to go into huge amounts of detail. I'll probably really look for more questions around this at the end because there's a lot that we've been through in that amount of time. And there's maybe sort of one or two very key learnings that have come out of it. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned, firstly, slides, if you, I mentioned earlier, we're, we're about 20 people, but the company is still quite young. The, the team is still quite young, the product is still quite young. And so we are you know, actively building the product. It's not something that's old and just being maintained. There are new features coming out all of the time. And that just maybe sets some context in terms of you know, the size of our business and, and where we're at. So you know, things were looking good. We adopted pretty much these tenants of um, of shape up, which was six week cycles and regroup periods, um, pitches and shaping and factoring. I think probably maybe the one missing major element from the book is how we report and heal charts, um, which is something that we don't do. Um, just we didn't have the tooling internally to do it. And there was a lot that we were taking on as it was anyway. Um, and so we just stuck with our existing tooling rather than changing tooling and process at the same time. Um, the first major concern, and this is probably something people will, will face when trying to adopt ShapeUp, um, and when I pitched it to both people inside the company, and when I was talking to some of my cohorts and, and network, uh, pe people within my network and, and product as well, when, they, when I was speaking about this, they, they were really shocked by six week cycles and two weeks of regroup. And there was kind of this fear that, all of a sudden that means you're just gonna slow down, right? If you're not working in two week sprints, then you're not gonna be shipping stuff fast enough and that's kind of crazy. And this is a graph of our production releases um, and uh, around the sort of first peak that you can see in that graph was when we adopted ShapeUp. 
Um, and so rather than velocity or release velocity or releases into production, um, oops, I uh, was overzealous on my keyboard there. Um, you know, rather than that going down, it, it actually went up. Um, and the trend over time for that has been going up, you know, over time, there are peaks and troughs obviously around Christmases and so on, but there was no drop in productivity or velocity as a result of this whatsoever. Um, and then the second scary thing for people was these regroups, like what do you do during a regroup period? And we've changed this now, but initially, you know, we tried a few different things. Um, again, I just remind people that like there was no book around about this at the time. Um, so we were stumbling our way through this in, in some places. And we initially started by like just really focusing on killing bugs, like or right the way down to the bugs that you would never prioritize and just kill them because quality is great. Um, we also used it as an opportunity for technical projects. So, you know, something to do with your deployment pipeline, for example, or infrastructure or for scaling. Um, and we actually found at the end of the day that didn't work very well because those projects were being compressed into, into two weeks. And it also sort of destroyed the, the idea of sprint fatigue. So people were you know, working for six weeks and then if they had a deadline to produce something in two weeks, they, they just sort of felt constantly under pressure if you had six weeks and two weeks and six weeks and two weeks. So that didn't really work. And I'll talk about, uh, about sort of what we do with the regroups later um, when I talk about how we sort of adopted and how we practice it ourselves. Um, but those were the two big things that you know just weren't problems. Oh yeah, and sorry, this was the final thing as well. <laughs> the other problem we ran into with the two week regroups being you know, available developer time is that if you have a two week regroup after a six week cycle, Parkinson's law applies and you basically have a six week, you have an eight week cycle. Like people will bleed into that cycle if they know that they can still be coding and still be pushing and this type of thing. So we kind of really put a stop to that now. And you know, the cycle ends when it ends and no more code around those projects happen anymore at the end of the cycle. Um, otherwise we just, you know, effectively had eight week back-to-back -back cycles as, as another problem that emerged from this. So, you know, that's something I would strongly suggest is if you're doing six and two, be really strict about six and two and make sure that you're actually, you know, using the break, the, the, the sort of um, the cool down periods for a better purpose than just continuing the cycle. <clears throat> And so then the sort of second group of things that we practice are pitches, shaping, and factoring. Um, and so this is an, is an example pitch. I, I just sort of brought it up from, from our system of something we did in cycle two or three. And this, I actually think there was a, an example of, of this from, from, from Ryan that I've seen before. I can't recall if it was in the book or one of the blog posts or maybe something he had sent to me, but it was actually a very similar project. Um, and this was, you know, we're a B2B uh, SaaS application and we're basically adding a feature for allowing users to be grouped. Um, and this was a great example of a kind of big batch project. It fit pretty much exactly into six weeks with the scope that we limited it. And, you know, I, it's a very simple document. I think this is one of the things we spent a lot of time trying to understand was what fidelity do you need to get to in a pitch? Some people felt that it needed to be a spec and it needed to be like 85, 90% complete. And it was only the very nitty gritty details um, that you needed to iron out. And you know, others felt it needed to be really, really loose and give the development team and the designers a lot of room to, um, to, to work with. Um, and I think this is something that we still sort of struggle with to really understand what is the right level um, of a pitch, but I'll give you some further examples from this one because this project was actually really successful. Um, it worked really well. The, out, the outcome was great. The output was great. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's pretty simple verbiage. There's no really, really detailed specification. So if you look at that paragraph, for example, ability to create groups of users, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really simple. It's not a specification. It's not really deep. It's just a couple of sentences. And that, that kind of level of detail is enough for, for people to work with. Um, these are some of the horribly primitive 
um, sort of fat marker type of drawings that I, I actually did them for this project myself. Um, and, you know, that's pretty much it. That was the level of design that, that, that came with the, with, the, with, with the pitch. That was it. Um, and then, you know, this is what it looks like now in, in production. Um, and so, you know, I, I think this is probably the area to really focus on the most is, and this is the area where you will, you'll go too far and you'll, 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 you'll pull yourself back from understanding what the right level of detail is um, in a pitch and what the right level of detail is in a design. So the examples I showed are probably as deep as you need to go. Um, and then in terms of factoring, you know, this is a fact. So every pitch that we write basically has a factored link document to it. So here you can see this is for a different project called automated backups. Um, and there was basically two areas of scope for this, not just the automated backups, but people could on demand click a button in the application and get a backup of their entire um, sort of team. And so this was basically how we did the, the, the factoring. So you, there's you know, some things further down. So I think this goes maybe to five points, um, which was the factoring. And then each of underneath the factoring are the subtasks or the tasks basically that sit under that particular piece of factored scope. Um, and people would just check them off as they went along. Um, you know, no need for any hugely complicated project management software. This document is a living document, it evolves. People add things there. You can see the the, the yellow underlines of people commenting on something. Um, so someone has maybe you know commented on that or discussed that. And again, this is sort of the level of detail that we will go to in factoring and in task breakdown in order to take something and turn it into a bunch of work that's a known quantity. Um, so everything was going really well, and we so we our cycles are sort of in, in a similar way to how hurricanes are labeled sort of A, B, C, D with people's names. We uh, being engineers started at O at zero and then started working forward from A, B, C after that. And they're all named after anything to do with books. We're an application that's got to do with writing and reading. So we named them after books. So the first one was, you know, Odyssey after, um, well, Holmes Odyssey. The second one, Margaret Atwood, Bilbo, um, being a character in a book, Cthulhu being well, another one. And then came Cycle D, Cycle Dora. And this basically became Cycle Disaster. And this is where I'll just talk about some issues that we ran into, maybe with our implementation, maybe with, with, the, with the process, I'm not sure. Um, but let's dig into that. And the major problem that came here was basically pitch team bottleneck. I'll be very impressed if anyone can name the movie from this one. Um, it, it's, it's related to my South African roots as well. Um, but this was basically the problem that we had is that in Cycle Dora, um, for some reason, we had a lot of small batch projects. There was no big batch. And we had a pitch team of two people, which is basically like myself and the CEO, who's also a very uh, product oriented person. And we had effectively three swim lanes underneath us, you know, three squads who could, who could handle work, which, which had three people in them, pretty much two developers and a designer in each one. And so we had two people producing work for nine people. Um, and because of the, um, the nature of the small batch work, um, that started to stack up. And, you know, if you look at in terms of how this looks is that during cycle A, for example, you're doing shaping for something that is going to be implemented in cycle B. Um, and for that particular cycle, during cycle C, we were basically shaping a very large number of pitches all in parallel to some extent, um, which would then start getting picked up later in cycle D. And obviously, you know, not all of those would get picked up in parallel, but you know, it started looking a bit like this. And that kind of started to remind me of me back in 1998, um, a little bit like, like this. And so this was a problem for us. And I'll talk a little bit about how we're going to solve and to how we sort of solve this later on. But this was basically the core problem is that a lot is dependent on the pitch, the quality of the pitch, the context of the pitch, the ability for the pitch to be ready in time, the ability for people creating the pitches to effectively be providing work 
to other people who are going to be implementing it. Um, and like I said, I'll, I'll talk to that in terms of what, what things look like um, now after the next intermission where I think we'll just take some more questions around adoption first and then we can move on to the final piece. Mike, can I jump in and ask you a question about that? I just wanna make sure mm. I was clear. Was there something there happening where the scale of the work was different, where all these little pieces were like smaller projects or what, what was going on there? It, so in the most of the, the cycles leading up to that, there had been a good blend of big batch and small batch work. So generally there had maybe been two big batch projects and then you know two or three small batch projects. But we never wanted to put projects into the pipeline based on their size. We wanted to do them based on customer demand and what we needed to do. And it just so happened that that particular cycle everything that we wanted to do we, and was sort of small batch and we almost felt this need to fill it up with more things and so it just put a lot of pressure on the team to you know almost fill up the pipeline of these small batch projects i don't know if that paints a more yeah i see okay mm -hmm. Mike, uh, just a very recent question to sneak that one in. Um, have you ever pitched a project that wound up being too ambiguous? Because you talked about you're still working towards kind of finding uh, the right level of, uh, of uh, pitch. Um, pitched project that's been too, too ambiguous. ambiguous. Well, so in order for a project to be pitched, if I go back a few slides, many slides. Um, oh, and by the way, we do have some movie notes in here. So it was uh, a couple of people at the same time who found this to be the gods must be crazy. Ah, exactly. That's it. Um, so you'll see there's a shape status completed on it. And something will only be picked up into a cycle once it's been completed. And generally, the process works is we will create an initial draft and that draft will be reviewed by other people in the business, people who might be working on it, designers, developers, that's when some of the ideas might start surfacing around how um, it might get factored. And so in order for something to get to green and completed, it really needs to be understood and unambiguous. And so nothing will ever go into a cycle with a huge amount of ambiguity. Um, it might not go in with maybe the right level of fidelity, which I think is some of the problems that we suffered from in Cycle Dora, where they were just, we hadn't explored enough rabbit holes. Um, and I'll also talk about who explores the rabbit holes a little bit later as well, which started, started to become problematic around the same time. All right, and you said uh, just like this question is from me now, nothing will ever go into a cycle with too much amb ambiguity, mm -hmm. um, but you shared this um, screenshot of a pitch document. Mm -hmm. Does that, that pitch document encapsulate all the shared knowledge around the solution then? Um, or is there implicit knowledge already implanted in a team that then takes on the work? That's a, that's a great question. And th there is now that maybe didn't used to be, and that's, I'll talk exactly around how our teams are now structured rather than having these sort of just three. So if I come back to these three swim lanes over here, these swim lanes could have been anything. So any pitch or any sort of either big batch or small batches could have gone into any one of these things. And so you could almost look at them as like a little factory of developing and design that can produce work, but there's maybe not institutional knowledge around a particular problem domain in each one of those in each one of those squads in this example um, that no longer exists we have um, sort of restructured a little bit to to handle that as well so I'll, I'll, I'll talk to that in a moment too All right because I also wanted to ask about your involvement in the <clears throat> cycles well I, I think that's so that's a great question in around sort of this cycle C, because in, in cycle B, in fact, I was spending a lot of time in, in pitch development. Um, and I was finding more and more of my time was getting dragged into pitch development. And if questions would arise during, I, I wasn't basically being that actively hands-on in the squads, 
right? So pe maybe people would ask a question or something and I, I, and I could address it, but I wasn't, this sort of pitch team, if you like, was quite separated because they had other priorities in terms of trying to produce pitches. Um, and obviously you, there's interaction happening between the pitch team and the squads, but you know, if, if your um, objective is to come out with shared pitches, that's what you're gonna focus on. And that's actually one of the major problems I think that we ran into um, having this sort of separate team who decides what to do, shapes a lot of it, has a lot of the context, and then basically gives it to another team to implement is something that hasn't worked for us and is something that we've that we've effectively changed, which I'll I'll talk to very shortly. Okay, perfect. And then I just want to touch back to the beginning of this section. Uh, where Nelson said that the six plus two insight was super helpful for my implementation. And um, I agree. And because you said if you, or you, you got to be wary of not bleeding into the two weeks of cool down. Yeah. So having yep. eight week back to back, and that's definitely something we're doing at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm curious to learn how did you make that sh mental shift in the team? How did you kind of initiate the fear of the circuit breaker, if you will? <laughs> um, well, I think it'll make a lot of sense when I talk about what the regroups are used for next. Um, but I'll, it's, you know, if, unless there's a forcing function on it, it it's going to happen. Um, and that's not an environment that we want it to be in. And so what we're doing now is, is probably a good forcing function, but I'd be kind of curious to understand if, if, if Ryan and, and and the folks over there were experiencing something similar or how they combated this? The, um, uh, what in particular is it that, that we might've combated? What was it? So one of the things Ryan I was talking about earlier is that if you have a six week cycle and then a two week cool down or regroup, what we were seeing in the early days was basically the cycle bleeding into the regroup pretty much every uh -huh. single time. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's just, as you said, the forcing function has to be there. I think it's just a disciplined thing coming from the top that if we, if we decide that this is important for the health of, of actually it, it, it affects everything. It's, it's, it's one of those things that if we, if we, if we don't keep the discipline of the size of our bets and we don't put that circuit breaker into place, everything else is gonna fall apart because that's the size that we're shaping to. It's the way that we set expectations when we make the bet, like everything trickles back backward from that again. So it's just, as you said, that forcing function just has to be there. Yeah. I mean, to, to me, I feel if, you, if you're if you adopting this and you're not doing something like this, you it's probably one of the key fundamental tenants. I think there are probably other pieces that you can plug and play depending on your team, but if you're not doing six and two, then it, it's not gonna work for you. And initially we didn't even start with six and two. I think we started with five and two, just for some reason, because reasons, right? Um, I can't remember why. I think we did something like five and two and then five and one so that we could get all of the, the cycles and so it could be a harmonic of so it could be a harmonic of your quarterly planning planning process or something ex like that, right? ex ex exactly. So it could fit in a calendar year. Um, yeah. And we, we, we don't do that anymore. Now we have like a calendar year where we meet up together. So because we're an offsite and a, a remote team, we have offsites and we've now basically built the offsites around the, the cycle cadence rather than the mm. other way around or anything like that. Like everything in the business now works around that cycle cadence. And it's, it's really important. It drives, it drives us. And it's not just us who are doing this now, like the marketing team, the growth team, um, other teams in, in the business now practice that same level of cadence and everyone sort of moves to that drumbeat. Um, let me sneak in two more questions and then we can continue. Mm -hmm. um, one real quick one. Do you have anybody not on the cycle cadence, any technical staff, let's say, like, do you have a security infrastructure performance team? Nope. nope. Every, everyone everyone's on the same cadence. All right, and then to, uh, on the on your pitch process, um, mm -hmm. Martin was asking, when you find that one pitch becomes too big, do you break it down into multiple future pitches? Kind of committing on the on a package of pitches, I guess. 
Um, you can. I, I feel that sometimes best intentions might not necessarily pan out if you kind of feel that maybe something is more important. So I'll, I'll give you an example um, in this one. So with groups, our intention was to use groups not only for permissions and administration, but for at mentions as well. So you can at mention a team. So like at mention developers, at mention designers, um, and if you look at the sort of ability to create groups of users, the, the, the verbiage is groups will purely be for permissions and administration, not for mentions. We'll probably look to extend this in the future to allow group mentions, including things. And maybe there was a previous version of this that had mentions in it. And when we started to assess the scope and we felt that it was gonna be too much, we just pulled it out. And there was no commitment to the business to to do it. Um, if we felt that it was important, then sure, we can look at it. But then, then you start getting into the world of backlogs and, and roadmaps. And, um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I just, we're not in a business that needs to commit certain scope or functionality to customers. We, we just don't do it. Um, we have our plan and we know what we need to do and we'll march to our own drumbeat. Um, and so, you know, that's not something that we need to do. Awesome. Okay. Um, so I think finally, I mean, this, not, this last bit shouldn't take too long. Um, and again, this is sort of open for some questions. So how we work now is probably a combination of three kind of seminal influences in my in my career of what I've seen. The first is, I don't know if anyone's read Marty Kagan's book, Inspired. Um, if you have it, I would, if you haven't, I would thoroughly recommend reading it. Um, and I was fortunate enough to be trained by Marty during my Skype days. Um, he, he was brought in and helped transition us from effectively what he calls sort of feature factories into high performing product teams. And, you know, the difference in this is quite subtle, but noticeable when you, when you see it happen. And so, for example, a feature team will just measure um, velocity and output rather than, than outcomes. Um, but, you know, what he really tries to do is he tries, he talks about the sort of holy triumvirate of the product design and development coming together to solve problems. Um, and I think that's really important. And so I'll talk a little about, about what we've taken from this into the process, um, but I think it's really, it's really important. It would be interesting just to get a show of hands or maybe if people haven't read it, just to let, let us know in the chat, but um, I, I would firmly recommend reading this book. The second comes from um, Spotify's engineering culture, which I think everyone's probably familiar with in terms of um, how, how they break down. And, you know, this is something that when I joined Slides, I assumed the team were practicing by how they had named things. And when I, I got into it, I realized that they weren't doing this at all. They were just calling a project uh, that lasted for a little bit of time, uh, a squad. Um, and they were very temporal and very, very ephemeral. Um, and I think it's really, really important to allow people to build up muscle memory and the main experience and to constantly work on solving problems within a related domain area, rather than jumping from one project to another where there's very little relationship between them. Um, and so this is sort of one of the aspects that we've taken from Spotify's engineering culture. And then finally, obviously, how we do um, how we do shape up. And so what we did is we took that engineering team that was made up of sort of three swim lanes, one engineering team, three swim lanes, one product person, um, and we divided it up into basically two tribes. Um, and in our application, it's as you've seen screenshots of it. It's um, it's got documents, notes, um, which is basically built by an editor. And so this is how you add content tables, paragraphs, spell check, um, these types of things. Um, and there's sort of structure, how people organize their content, their sharing, there's um, sort of how people drive, get to content. And so 
I've been through so many exercises where you can cut teams in different ways and you know there's probably right ways and wrong ways to do it for your business. Um, I won't advise you on that, but what I found is just go with the one that has sort of that's most obvious to you. You can literally I've been in rooms where you've I've argued about how you break a team up into for three days. Um, don't do that. Just take something logical. And so now we now have two tribes. So we've got the editor tribe, which builds the editor, and we've got the access tribe that sort of drives people towards the content that are that are in that's inside the editor. And the shaping doesn't now happen at the sort of high level company um, uh, sort of committee or sort of team, if you like. The shaping happens inside each one of these tribes. And that's been a really important distinction for us to do. One of the issues that we were faced with is when you, no, no matter how well people write, um, when you get sort of handed something that's kind of maybe been pre-shaped um, and you haven't explored all of those rabbit holes yourself and someone else has explored them for you, you might not understand exactly why some of those decisions were made. Or sometimes it's actually really important to explore those rabbit holes and to find the failures inside of them to give you better insight into why you're doing something a certain way. Um, and so this has been a key step into sort of how we're working at the moment, which we feel is working a bit better in the past. I have no kind of metrics other than some business metrics are going up a little bit more than they were in the past. Um, but basically, <clears throat> so how that works, as I said, each tribe has a, a product owner, as a designer and has a number of developers. Um, and then there's a few supporting roles that are shared between them, um, like, a, like a data analyst, for example. But like most importantly is the product manager or the product owner is there to provide context, provide customer context, provide business context. Um, as much as possible when the product people are doing sort of customer interviews or talking to customers, they're also doing so with, a, you know, with the designers or where even possible the developers. Um, and so, but it's important here that the product owner is not designing the software, right? Um, secondly, is the team chooses what to work on. The tribe chooses what to work on. So if the tribe have a set of KPIs that they know that they need to move upwards, they choose which pitches go in, right? It's their product, their product area, their success, their metric. They get to choose what they decide to work on given some business context and some, some strategic context. So we have a strategic focus for the year that everyone is aware of. And given through that lens, they choose their pitches. And then finally is the team members shape the pitches. So rather than in the previous model where it was sort of the effectively the CEO, co-founder and myself um, shaping the pitches is the team members, the people who end up who are going to write it get heavily involved in the shaping process. Um, and so the cadence in terms of how that works is the six week cycles are for the works and we use the regroups for group shaping. And so generally what happens when we kick off the regroup, we know what pitches that we're going to do. We know in terms of like our rough appetite for them. Um, and we will, they will have some context to them. They will have some background, some ideas that have been incubating for a little while, but that two week period is used for the team to start shaping um, those pitches. And during this time, I've, we've, sometimes we've built prototypes in those two weeks, just to even understand maybe if it's something that's heavily UI centric, how this might actually look and feel in real life. Um, but this has been great for the team to really understand and get into and explore the rabbit holes themselves and just provide more context to, um, to what they're doing. Um, and secondly, is the team know that this is an activity that they need to do together and having distractions like um, sort of the, the, the previous cycle spilling over or having distractions like technical projects um, or having distractions like squashing all the bugs during this time period um, just doesn't become a thing. And so what we find is during this two week period is that there's just a lot of people talking, communicating, sharing ideas, drawing. Um, and not, you know, a huge amount of time like under the whip to try and push something out. And so far, things have been well shaped during these two week periods. Um, and we've actually had some of probably our more successful projects or recently as we've matured to this model. Um, 
just in terms of how we do a few other things is we have um, there's you know I spoke earlier about all the ceremony that we've got rid of we basically now have just one kind of team meeting which is done both synchronously and asynchronously every Friday so every tribe has a meeting every Friday um, there's asynchronous preparation for that meeting done where people actually write up the agenda and almost have a, a meeting asynchronously in notes and then they just get together for also to see each other and to communicate with each other and they will basically just go through the work that they're going to do next week make sure everyone's aligned um, just go through any bug reports figure that figure some stuff out one of the big questions we faced earlier is actually how do you do bugs when you're working with six week cycles and projects and all these types of things. And basically what we do is Monday is bug day. And so every Friday we'll pick the bugs that are going to be done and they'll be basically addressed on Monday. And this is more a practicality than anything else. Obviously, if something crops up during the week that's critical or high priority that really needs to be jumped on, which is very rare, we'll pick it up. But generally this is how people work. So they're kind of um, you know, get their day going, and then the rest of the week is completely clear, distraction-free to to work on the, the 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 pitch and the project that they're working on. And then finally, and also really importantly for us, is that the technical projects happen during cycles, and they're treated exactly like other projects. The technical project will have a pitch, like why are we doing this? Factor it, and you get to choose it. In relation to the other pitches that are on on the on the cards, and so they're not treated now now like snowflakes. They are not treated or compressed into two week periods that people have to wait eight weeks between. Um, they just they happen like any normal project, any user facing project, any business project, any customer project. That's how our tech projects happen, um, and they go through exactly the same process as as everything else. So this might include, you know. Um, regional scaling, which you know is not a is not a user sort of facing project, if you like, but it's it, it has very similar patterns um, when you get into the nitty gritty. Um, so that's 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 how we've landed. Um, we've been practicing this now for probably the last three cycles, um, and we're pretty happy with how it's working out for us. I, I think the team have. A lot more context and background as a result of the the shaping happening inside the team, um, and they have a lot more sort of autonomy um, and commitment to their own outputs by being able to select what goes in. Um, and I think that's pretty much everything I had to say. All right, um, bunch fantastic. of questions. Yeah, it's fantastic. Thank you, Mike. Um, I, this is something I, I, I missed on you. Out, I, so you go I'm, ahead. I'm, I'm, I'm just I'm really pleased to see um, it's exactly the kind of thing I was hoping to get out when I when I introduced in the beginning that we were trying to go from the Ford Model T to a more modular understanding of of all these ideas. And I really like how um, Mike pointed out this notion that the the pitching and the shaping and the betting can actually happen on a kind of uh, team level rather than just from the top down. We actually have a kind of hybrid model where we have some of the same thing happening. Um, our iOS and Android teams are working very much the way that Mike described. And then our uh, sort of uh, core product team, which is mainly doing the web product, is a bit more driven from the very top. Um, actually, not a bit more. I mean, it's, it's completely driven from the very top. Um, and uh, so we actually have both of these models, but I didn't even see the contrast between them until Mike described it. So. Uh, it's really helpful. Actually, that reminds me, I, I forgot to mention how we initially, because we have a very collaborative kind of trying to marry bottom up and top down as much as possible in our culture. And when we first, maybe the first two cycles, anyone in the company could start the pitch and then submit it. And then the sort of Chris and I would go through all of the pitches, pick which ones to do, and then start fleshing them out. Um, and that didn't work very well for us at all because you would basically just get this huge laundry list of ideas and you spend a lot of time going through it. And, you know, you'd find people like submitting things over and over again. And then all of a sudden, like you had some social dynamics to work out where you, you didn't want to just keep saying no to this person. Um, so, totally. I, you know, it's, it is a good balance to try and figure out where the, where the,
the selection and the authoring kind of happens and what works for, for you, depending on your culture, depending on where your product is in its maturity and so on. Yeah, I think there were a bunch of questions in the chat around that, what do you call it, marrying kind of bottom up and top down approach. Uh, so a lot of questions around who does uh, the strategic um, and business direction setting. Can you maybe yep. talk about that and how it yep. kind of trickles down into a betting table that the tribes hold or? Yeah, sure thing. So it we have like effectively an executive team um, and it's given the size of our company, it's pretty small. It's three of us. Um, there is myself who runs product. There's the CEO um, who's one of the co-founders and the CTO who's the other co-founder. Um, we try and look at our strategy A, annually and then B, revisited every six months to tweak it. So we're definitely trying not to follow what I've seen in some other places like strategy du jour where every six months or every three months, everyone's now working on this and everyone's sort of now working on that. So I'll give you some like pure examples from, from our own business. Last year, we really focused on um, how people manage knowledge and how, and, and in particular larger teams. And so with that lens, for example, the group, the groups of users or the automated backups are two examples that I showed you. Those are more kind of enterprise like features, larger teams, they need those types of things. Some of the other projects we did around sort of easily dragging and dropping to organize projects. And so that was basically the cut the context we gave to people um, then, but we were choosing the the pitches to go into that. And then this year we're really much more focused on some of the collaborative aspects of, of slides, and that's the sort of um, guidance that people are given is like, we're not, we, 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 we check that box on, on knowledge management. We check that box on um, sort of larger teams. This year, we're really focusing on, on collaboration. And these are the sort of two or three metrics that we're trying to move um, in the business. So, you know, they might, I'm not going to go into what they are, but just these, these are the metrics. Um, and given those lenses, you people are responsible enough to, to kind of figure it out. Um, like I, I, I still sit in one of the teams and so I'm able to provide that, that guidance and that lens to it as well. Um, but, you know, this is one of the other advantages with, with having people in these tribes more permanently is they start to understand, okay, this is the problem domain that I'm trying to solve. This is what collaboration means in a, in a text editor. Um, these are the types of things that I'm trying to solve. Okay, we did this, this move that metric over there. And you start to build up this inherent knowledge around a, a problem domain. Um, so I hope that answers the question. I think something we're touching on here is that um, strategy happens actually at different levels of abstraction. In the same way that you do problem solving at different levels of abstraction between shaping and then actually building inside of the cycle, the shaping is, is, is problem solving, but it's not the same level of problem solving because you're delegating a lot of details down. The same thing can happen with strategy where you could have the executive team choosing the exact shaping and, and pitching and betting. They could be doing all of that work together at the top. And then none of that strategy work is getting delegated and the output is just the specific bets and what happens in the cycle. Or um, we're seeing other teams like, uh, including I think what Mike is describing, where there's a, there's a level of strategic um, shaping that is more abstract than an individual project, which is something like, this is the overall type of metric that we're looking at, or this is sort of the directionally the kind of thing, like let's say at Basecamp, it could be that um, we might say, we want to think about improving to-dos more than other aspects of the product, right? If we were looking at it from a supply side, and then we might be more interested in projects that are to-do related, um, but the one who says to-dos are the important thing right now doesn't necessarily need to be the one who's shaping specific projects, right? And, and so that relationship of, of sort of how the direction comes down and then who interprets that direction, that can become, you can start to look at it like a kind of filtering mechanism, mm -hmm. right? Where someone sets the filter at a high level and that filter then is selecting and rejecting potential projects that are getting shaped at some lower level. Yeah, I agree with that completely. And I think maybe the more mature your product is, the easier and your team is, the easier that is to do, right? I think if you're quite nascent, that might be a bit more a bit more difficult to 
to really abstract that high up. So Mike, there are a couple of follow-up questions uh, on, on that strategic direction setting. Be, um, because I think you also mentioned OKRs in the beginning. Um, and maybe you can, can you go in a bit more detail what exactly is handed to the teams? Uh, like what artifact, yeah, so, I think? So we, we don't really follow a really strict OKR. We just have or like OKRs in terms of how they break down. We effectively, for example, for this year, we have two key metrics that drive that are driving the business. Um, and I'll leave it to your imagination what they might be. Um, but you know, and, and everyone everyone just attaches to those and 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 understands them. And one of them is not revenue, by the way. Um, so <laughs> otherwise, we would be making you know like revenue oriented decisions. And that's not where we are in our customer life cycle in our, in our, in our company life cycle at the moment. And so do you uh, go into a pitch um, with kind of a, a guesstimate of how something might move the needle in what kind of what the mechanics would be? I think you get different flavors of being able to do that. So I think if you look at like a traditional growth team and how they might, um, you know, stack rank projects in terms of their impacts and risk and, and implementation, we're definitely nowhere near that. Um, we basically try and, and be a little bit more speculative on the benefit that something might, that something might give. Um, but we don't, we're not at that point where we're saying, well, doing this will give us a three percentage point bump in, in daily active users, for example. Um, we're, we're, we're not there yet as an organization. And um, maybe a question from me, have you ever had to step in or overrule a kind of decision on projects that got picked up by a tribe? <laughs> that's a good question um i i don't think i've ever had to basically put my foot down and say no this is enough of the conversation we're doing it my way um i think people are with with small company people are pretty responsive to each other and when it comes to that and you know i i definitely don't want this world where where, where you're trying to drive for some sort of democ democracy. Um, and so we just basically commit to something. We, you don't necessarily all need to agree on it, but we'll just agree to commit. And then once you've agreed to commit, you commit. Um, and you don't necessarily need consensus. That's a very, very powerful and important point that we, that we also rely on that, this, this, this disagree and commit thing, this is really useful. Um, so Matt sent me a friendly reminder to ask you, Ryan, about the shape up process, new product, established product uh, question uh, regarding kind of uh, hey.com as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, so the first thing I just want to mention is that um, uh, I did add a piece to the book on this subject um, after the first version came out. So it's possible people haven't seen it. Um, and uh, it's in the, uh, the last appendix where it's uh, under how to begin to shape up. There's a section called new versus existing products. Um, and that outlines the, the sort of key point. Um, the, the, the key thing here is um, if we are going to shape something, pitch it, bet on it, and then expect it to, 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 to get shipped, um, we need to have a certain amount of clarity about um, wh what we're doing and, and how confident we can be that it's the right thing to do. And um, when you have a, a product that already exists and then you are kind of um, filling in the cracks uh, because there's a, some capability that's missing, some capability that's not quite doing the right thing, you know, that sort of a thing. You have a lot of reference points because there's a bunch of things in the existing system that are not going to change, right? And so those create very kind of clear boundaries um, where it's, it makes it easy to, to imagine what you're going to do and to not be too wrong. <laughs> like it might not work out, 
but it's not going to be a deep question of what is the right architectural way to approach the problem. On the other hand, when you're doing a new product, the entire database schema could change. The, the very core underlying model could change. You don't actually have those that concrete that's poured and those pillars that are standing there that are holding the house up that you are working around. The very concrete and the very pillars are still in question. And so it's not reasonable um, to, to say it, to declare, this is what we're going to do and then have a team do it and then, uh, and, then, and then get the result that you want. There's simply too much uncertainty and too much learning that's happening through the very construction process. So what we find is that um, in the early phase of a new product, when we don't yet know, the question is this, do we have a settled architecture for the main pieces of functionality, both front end and back end? Do we have the key pieces in place from a user interface and a back end standpoint so that like the very essential pieces of the functionality, we know where they belong and how they work and how they're modeled and those things are fixed. As soon as we get to that point, we can flip to standard shape up practices. Until we're at that point, we might be tearing the whole house down and rebuilding it up again because of what we're learning and what we're experimenting with. So we, we, we refer to these, we call these R&D phase and production phase. That's just our words for it. And when we are in the unsettled architecture phase, um, the shaping and building are all happening in a blurry mix. And, and, and the betting is, is, is very loose. Basically, we're gonna say, we're gonna bet, let's say six weeks on exploring this or that aspect of, what, of our hunch of what we think might be, we might be able to come together something that works for this product, right? So with Hay, there were cycles where David, was, David and Jason and, and Jonas were working together for six weeks and they had a directional idea of what they were experimenting with but it, the, the, there, wasn't a, there wasn't a clear shaping step and there wasn't a, a clear bet on a specific project, right? After having gone through that for a couple cycles, enough pieces started to snap together that they said, ah, we have something and we know what this product is and these pieces of the implementation are now fixed and, and everything else is gonna be built around those. Now we have the, the boundaries and the context to make, um, uh, clearer bets and delegate those bets because the people that we were delegating to had a structure that they were working inside of. So that's, I, I, it's a bit long. I don't have a shorter way to explain it yet, but that's, that's the basics of the approach. You need to work in a completely, it's, a, it's actually quite a different world um, before you get to, um, before you get to that settled architecture and then you flip back into uh, standard shaping and pitching and betting. Right, thank you. And Gareth just pasted the link to the section in ShapeUp as well. Uh, thanks for that. So thank you for that. Um, Mike, I want to, uh, there's questions to you uh, as well, still queued up. So I want to come back to kind of the um, arrangement of tribes. Uh, I, you uh, briefly, well, can you talk a bit about the process that went into this specific split? into two tribes uh, and what they are lined around. And also I, I was wondering whether or what objections did you face to this specific split? Um, there weren't really, I, I was expecting maybe more objections. I thought people might feel that they didn't want to be pigeonholed in a particular problem domain for a long period of time. Turns out the, the opposite was true. People absolutely wanted to get stuck in solve media problems and continue to solve them um, and move forward. So that was um, unexpected from, from my perspective. I think the main argument just came down to what is the natural division for how you break up those, those teams? Um, and I think you, you could do it in different ways, depending on the nature of your product, depending on the maturity of your products and your company. Um, you could, I, I saw a question around sort of personas or use cases there. You could maybe say, okay, well, this, team's going to focus on knowledge management and this team's going to focus on collaboration. And it's, as long as you, I think where you pick the solution that has the fewest gray areas and the fewest overlaps, otherwise you're not 
you, you, you need to have as much true ownership as possible. If you have this thing or too many things that float between the two teams, then generally no one takes responsibility for it. And I, I think that's probably the worst situation that, that, you can, that you can be involved in. And we still have those things. There are pieces of the product that you could logically put in any team. And we've just said, no, they belong here. This team owns it end of and sometimes yes they do have to go to the other team to maybe get a bug fixed or something like that but as long as that ownership is clear and again it's committed to right you just agree commit move forward um that's the most important thing like w when i was at, at skype and we did a, a similar exercise we literally we had like most of some of the senior leaders in the company in a room for three days arguing over what what that product split might might look like and you know like i said you will always find holes and things that don't match and at the end of the day you just need to do something logical and i think at, at skype we looked at it on probably more product area like you know video concerns like video um signaling and video calling concerns are very different to messaging concerns and those were sort of two logical separations and so similarly with us we have like actually writing stuff in an editor and then sort of sharing and organizing and filing and and sort of commenting are kind of quite different and the commenting is actually the biggest gray area that we have by the way because you can argue it kind of fits in in, in either place but um yeah that's that's kind of the process and we just try to do it as quickly as possible not spend too much time um, and move forward. And we will probably do another split as the team grows um, and, you know, just keep doing that when it, when, it, when it makes sense. But, you know, that's not what, we're not optimizing for the splits, we're optimizing for ownership and ownership of outcomes and metrics. Yeah, that's great. Uh, actually, on a kind of a personal note, I had uh, the question, or why I raised this question as well was, uh, I think our team, uh, on the technical side is um, a kind of uh, generally opposed to a split of any kind um, with one of the arguments being uh, that um, individual team members lose context in certain areas of the code base. Um, is that something you, you faced? No, I, I, I don't think so. It's, I don't know if it's because of the nature of our code base or the fact that people were all working on the same things at some point and now there's a different split, but I, I haven't really seen that too much, to be honest. All right. Um, any, any more questions? There was a good question I thought about user research. Oh yeah, go ahead. So we try and do that before, and that is one of the inputs. So when I spoke about the, the product owner brings the context, that is something we try and do before in terms of not like usability research, for example, but actual, you know, more user research, customer discovery, product discovery. We try and do that before, and that's the context that we bring to everyone to shape. And the, the better you, you can do that and the more context you bring to people the better and then you know what we'll find is when people are trying to develop something or trying to shape something is they'll often come and also you know they'll have the historical um, sort of meeting notes of all of those interviews we use product board and so all of the insights that have been linked from um, the customer service or anything that might be attached to it is, is all there and so the team have all of this context um, if there's if something is heavily usability orientated, there might be during the two week um, sort of like some level of prototyping and just rapidly putting it in front of some people or maybe even in the first two weeks of the cycle, just do some rapid prototyping, put it in front of, of, of people from a usability prototyping perspective. Awesome. Since Mike, you seem to be also monitoring the chat, maybe let me just get out of the way for the remainder of this um, until you also call time. I think you you said you have up to 90 minutes, so I, we don't want to stretch your time too much as well. 
Um, sure, I didn't. I didn't spot anything else that I missed there. I just saw that one particular one. There was another conversation going on to Ryan about prototyping. And then there's the last one now to just to confirm. Does that mean that the whole tribe is building something in a cycle? The product owner is doing this discovery for another shaping candidate. So no, why so the, the so the product the product owner is just is also helping unblock the team. So being highly available for questions, um, like being a facilitator within the team. The team meeting notes, for example, that I spoke about, you know, that, that happened on a Friday. We try and do our meetings as asynchronously as possible. And the, the product owner is responsible for putting that agenda together, just writing some background, um, just pushing things along and blocking. But yeah, speaking to customers as much as I mean, we spend, you know, like for me, for example, you know, I do this role um, as well. And so, I have a bunch of messages in the intercom that are going out to our customers, either generic ones, either more specific ones. Um, being on customer calls as much as possible is probably like one third of my job. Um, and then providing that context to people um, for future pitches, for things we might even be thinking about in six months time, just still starting to be in listen and learn mode. And then, Ivan was asking about the whole tribe works on one project. No, so we'll probably the, the 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 tribe will have two or three active active projects, maybe one big batch and some smaller ones, um, or two maybe two big batches. Even it it, it depends. There, um, there there are enough people in each one to sort of handle two or three things in parallel. Um, have you trashed a project yet? In in the sense that it wasn't ready by week six, so you. Hit delete. Um, no, we've never trashed anything, but we have identified things that we knew, like we could not ship this into production in six weeks, basically. Um, and in in those cases, so for example, one of them was like a massive overhaul of of the underlying technology in the editor, and you know, it took sort of migration of notes, and it was like a really, really big project that you couldn't just put a small piece in basically. And so for those types of things, we will, the objective will still be to turn something on in production under a feature flag to us, for example, and you can go and turn it back on, but there's something that's committed to that's shipped that you can like point to and say yes, and you can use it and feel it and understand it. Um, like there's never something where there's just this magic ball of ever evolving engineering work that no one ever puts their hands on. I think it's really important to, to use software as soon as possible. And so that's what we do with all of those. Like recently we did quite a substantial redesign of our navigation and it, it took two cycles. We, not, we knew it would take two cycles because we also wanted to get like real world feedback on it. And so in the first cycle, we shipped it under a feature flag to ourselves to 50% of new users and to a number of existing users. And then we knew that the second cycle would be refining some of the feedback. So we actually left the scope quite open and we were just a bit more responsive in the second cycle, um, improve, improve, improve. And by the time we shipped, all of the metrics for the new one were, perform were outperforming the, um, the control in the A-B test. And so that went really well. That's really awesome. I'm going to have to rewatch this whole thing. because um, I'm, I'm taking so much uh, home right now. So much things I want to kind of remember, come back to. All right. It looks like there, there's no more questions. Um, so. <laughs> Peter Von from Gareth. Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, so, so maybe to Ryan, uh, do you want to answer this one by Gareth? Uh, when you were developing and testing the ideas in ShapeUp, how were you assessing whether they were working in the sense that the feedback cycle of process change can be really long? Yeah, so um, ShapeUp was not, um, ShapeUp as a method is, um, is something that grew organically through, a, through an unplanned, uncoordinated process of trial and error. Uh, so it wasn't a question of is this working or not. It was a it was a accumulation 
of many, many techniques that were each experiments and then they either survived or they didn't. And then they kind of grew together into a whole. Uh, so, so there wasn't really a moment of like, we're trying a thing in this big whole process. It was you know, the idea to work, for example, uh, in a six week cycle was a completely independent practice from um, uh, realizing that we needed to shape better before a cycle starts, right? And the practices that we use to shape were totally independent. And uh, the way that we uh, uh, factor uh, to-dos into lists and, and do the hill chart and so on was also a totally independent thing that developed. And these all kind of grew together in different ways. So um, I'm guessing that's the question was about developing and testing the actual practices, not about the not about developing and testing the 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 book um, as a description of those. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah. All right, everybody. Um, thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Mike, for this awesome presentation. Thank you, Ryan, for getting this thing or helping getting this thing off the ground. Hey, this has been amazing. Yeah, thank you so much. And really, thank you, Mike. I thought the presentation was fantastic. I'm really glad it's recorded. I think people will get a lot of value out of seeing the, the recorded version, people who weren't here today. I hope so. And thanks, David, for organizing this. It's really, it was, came as a surprise out of the blue when, when we first spoke. And it's really fantastic to see such a buoyant community forming around this. So um, looking forward to the next one. And awesome, let's yeah. all continue to, you know, let's all share our experiences with each other about, you know, I, I, I took this and changed that. And then we did it this way instead of that way. And then we learn, we learn where those orthogonalities are, where those um, modularities are in the whole way of working, right? So then we can all see, okay, maybe I should do it more like Slight did than the way the base camp did or whatever, right? And we can start to build up some knowledge about the space of possibilities of how one can adapt this. And I think we'll all learn a lot through that. Ryan, where do you want people to share this, these kinds of? I think the, I think the forum is probably the, the most um, uh, accessible and flexible place to, to, to do that sort of a thing. Um, so that's, I would invite everyone to check out the forum and, uh, and, 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 and share their experiences and ask questions of each other there. All right, so I'm just gonna plug the link to the forum into the chat real quick. Yep, there you go. All right. <laughs> Let's wrap this up. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day or night, depending on where you are. And hope to see a lot of you back for the second edition. So, yeah. So let's give it about four weeks and then do this again. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Sounds great. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, David. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. Thanks.